Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have to open your word together this morning. So we invite your spirit's presence here. We pray that you can enlighten our minds and our understanding and that our characters can be affected and that we can influence those around us. Good. We pray for each person who is struggling to understand these things and searching in your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit can aid and guide them. And uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, you can bless each person, that you can help them in their day-to-day -day struggles in life. And we pray that you can be here now as we uh, study together. Is that our prayer in Jesus' name? Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another week of morning studies. Um, we finished off on Thursday dealing with uh, this chart that Stephen Jameson had made. Now, he's just added a little bit to it, so I just wanted to review this. Um, so one of the things that we have, have seen is that we have these connections between uh, 977 BC, these civil wars, and um, but we can go back and look at this line uh, addressing 1533 years. Now, part of this has to do with the 1533 itself. So you may not remember everything that we were looking at, but one of the things that, that Colin had done is he had noticed the 1,347 days from August 11th, 1840 uh, to um, April 19th, 1844, followed by 186 days, which is 187 inclusive days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844. So that makes up 1,533 days. And so that 1,533 becomes a symbol of the wonderful manifestation of the power of God and the compares the exodus to that period from 1840 to 1844, from when the message is empowered to October 22, 1844. And so uh, we've recognized quite a few years ago the significance of the 1533 years. So we have this 1533 days um, in, in uh, Millerite history. And then we had a connection in our history. So that's going to be from Trump's election on November 9th um, all the way to uh, July 18 is going to be 1,347 days. And then there's another 186 inclusive days, 187 inclusive days, 186 cardinal days to Biden being um, inaugurated. And so we believe that that uh, uh, parallel is correct, that it, it tells us something, and there's a first disappointment and a second disappointment. Now, so here we have this chart dealing with the 1533 years and tying us to 977. So so what does this uh, 1533 years and 977 indicate? What, why are we looking at this? What's important in 977? Just to kind of get you guys uh, thinking and answering questions. It's pretty evident on the chart, but if you articulate it, it might help a little bit. Get your minds focused. 977 was the dividing of the kingdom. Yes, and we have a particular date. So it's not just about the dividing of the kingdom, because technically the kingdom's going to divide earlier in 977, probably um, prior to the spring or around the time of the spring that we're going to have this. Uh, so we're going to have the division actually occur prior to the spring. So we're going to have uh, Solomon. He's going to pass away um, probably not quite in 977. He might pass away like in December of 976. That would probably be about the earliest. No, he would have passed away in 978. Yes, yes, 978. And then um, 
So by January of 977, February maybe, he could have lived that long. But anyway, it's going to be somewhere in there around the the time where we go into the year 977 from 978. Um, and that's just from the logistics of looking at all the things that happen. So there is, of course, Rehoboam becomes the king, and then you're going to have Jeroboam and, and the people uh, rebel because of the heavy taxation. And then he's going to have to build uh, these two altars, one in Dan, one in Bethel, with these golden calves, and then he's going to set up this counterfeit uh, feast or fast day, you know, religious feast. Um, and he's going to put it on the 15th day of the eighth month. So it's going to be uh, one month and five days after the Day of Atonement. That's going to, he's going to be alter, offering at the altar in Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month. And that's a symbol of August 15th. And November 22nd is also a symbol. And it represents Thanksgiving, even though this one's technically a Sabbath, not a Thursday. Um, we do have uh, times in which the 15th day of the eighth month and the 22nd of November align. And in the year that the prophecy of Josiah is fulfilled, that's 627 B.C., um, the 15th day of the eighth month is also going to be November 22nd. So that's 350 years uh, later. Now, when exactly the prophecy of Josiah is fulfilled, um, that's uncertain. We don't know exactly the date that this occurs, but it is possible that it occurs um, at that time. So may maybe this is a prophecy that does have a specific connection to to the date that he's going to. It doesn't say that explicitly. Um, but it is possible, so we just don't know. Um, from 627 BC, uh, we're going to have this uh, uh, count of 40 years to the siege, and from 977 BC, 390 years to the siege. So in January, whenever it's 6th, I think it is, in uh, 587 BC, the siege is going to begin. It's going to be on the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year of Zedekiah. Um, and, and so this prophecy of Josiah was extremely important in us understanding, um, July 18th. So after we had discovered July 18th, 2020, based upon Ezekiel and also upon Revelation 9, Josiah Lich's prophecy. And, and remember, we connected these two, uh, that is, uh, the prophecy of Josiah and the prophecy of Josiah Lich back in 2016. Jeff was excited about that. He shared the, the, the he put it a DVD that he would pass out as he was going around in 2016. Uh, after the School of the Prophets that we were at, where I presented this. So I presented this on July 16th, um, 2016. I presented the prophecy of Josiah and Josiah Lich connected, but we had not used them to predict any events in the future. It wasn't until after uh, the 391 and a half days from October 13th to November 9th, 2019, and all the connections there with Islam that we then made this prediction about July 18, 2020. Uh, but the point here is that we have this after we had figured this out. We then related this prophecy of the Thanksgiving prediction. So we, we could see that this was a natural progression of understanding. Once we started to understand November 9th and July 18th, and we began looking at the civil wars because of Ellen White's civil war visions, this obviously made sense. We're talking about the North and the South already long before I had considered looking at um, these civil wars in relation to the North and the South, um, typifying what happens in our history even before we had November. But now we had some keys that we could look at 
and put together. And so we made this prediction. And that prediction, uh, which is not on this chart, was a prediction regarding uh, November 22nd, 2018. So as we continued looking at this, um, we could see that the 15th day of the eighth month lining up with either the Julian or the Gregorian calendar, I mean, it's going to happen with the Gregorian once every, you know, 30 years, right, roughly. Um, not in a regular pattern. It can sort of clumps together based on how the solar year and the biblical year line up. So it's a little bit rather complicated pattern. Um, but since we we have these two, uh, eight, 15th day of the eighth month lining up with November 22nd in the Julian calendar, in connection with the prophecy of Josiah. And we had this 22nd of November um, in connection with the prediction in 2018, which showed that we can't predict external events. Um, we have this 2024 and 2029. So the 2024 is connected with this 3,000 years. And then we have a five years. Now, he didn't put the five years in here. Um, but the five years had to do with um, uh, the flood itself, right? So in the flood itself, there was a five years um, dealing with uh, the death of Lamech. Is it the death of Lamech five years before the flood? I think that's what it is. So, so there's this symbol there. This brings us all back to the flood. It brings us to the exodus. It brings us to the dividing of the kingdom. And then um, the two periods of 120 years in there. So this this five years between 2024, which comes from the 3,000 slain, and it's more complicated than that. Um, so when we get to the 15th day of the eighth month, which is November 22nd, which is Thanksgiving in 2029, um, I mean, there's more that could be put on this chart, but... Uh, why is 2029 significant, uh, November 22nd, bes besides that uh, specific date? What What is it about that year that begins in 2029, the Jewish year? So what is it about it? Anybody remembers? So the Jewish year... Right. So remember, we have these Jewish years. Right. And they're going to start either in the spring or in the fall. You have a, a spring year would be their religious year. The civil year begins in the fall. Right. And I know I went through a lot of information there, but the Jewish year that begins in 2029 will begin on the first day of the seventh month. And that is October 10th, 2029. Now, October 10th, what's the significance of October 10th? On the Gregorian calendar, that would be the 10th day of the 10th month. But what is it on the, the biblical calendar? Well, it's going to be the first day of the seventh month. Okay. Right. So, so it's going to be uh, the beginning of the Jewish year, the civil year. And, and the Jewish civil year precedes the biblical year, which often confuses people. That is, if we're going to look at the Jewish civil year 2030, you would actually start that in the fall of 12, 2029, because most of the Jewish year 2030 is going to, or most of the that year, that Jewish year, is going to consist of dates that are in the year 2030, because it's going to start October 10th. So you just got, you know, less than three months of our Gregorian year that aligns with that Jewish year. So normally you would just call it the year 2030, right? The Jewish year 2030. We have that same thing when Jehoiachin's taken uh, captive, right? He's going to be, um, or not Jehoiakim, Daniel's taken captive in the third year of Jehoiakim. And that third year we sometimes just call 606 BC but it actually begins in the fall of 607, right? So if we're going to say the year 2030 on the Jewish calendar, on the civil year, it would begin October 10th, 
October 10th is a symbol of the siege. We already talked about that in connection with the prophecy of Josiah. And um, so then we're going to have, of course, the religious year begin on April 30, or April 30th, April 5th, 2030, in the year 20, right, 2030, which is you know, six months after the, the Jewish year, civil year begins, right? So that 2030 um, has two different New Year's days, one in the fall of 2029 and one in the fall of or the spring of 2030. Those are both going to be starting a Jewish year. The first civil from fall to fall, the second religious from spring to spring. Okay. So this Thanksgiving in 2029 we're not predicting anything about it. We don't, we don't believe that we can predict events, but we can see that it stands there as a symbol. And you have uh, the 350 years and we can see the 3005 years can be the same symbol. So that 350 years from the flood to the death of Noah, the 350 years of the prophecy of Josiah. And now we have this uh, 3000 years. And five years. So it, it points to something, symbolically at least, about our future. And we know that we have um, these presidential Thanksgivings. So he didn't he didn't put the Thanksgiving there in 2024 on this diagram, uh, but he probably should have, but he didn't. Um, but we would look at the Thanksgiving there. Now the Thanksgiving in 2024. Um, so next year um, is going to be, uh, if I remember correctly, I'm just going to check. Yeah, so it's going to be the 21st, right? So, yeah. And and we know that when we look at 2023, it's going to be, because 2024 is a leap year, it's going to be the 19th, I believe. I'm trying to make sure I get this right. Right. So so Thanksgiving in 2023 was, um, pardon me, so 2023 was, okay, I went backwards. Yeah, 2023, so the Thanksgiving we just had was the 23rd. And because we have a leap year, it's going to move to the 21st. So, in, so we don't have a... Um, a Thanksgiving on the 22nd, right? So between the Thanksgiving 2023 and Thanksgiving 2024, it's going to skip November 22nd. It's going to move from the 21st to the tw uh, 23rd to the 21st, right? Instead of moving to the 22nd. Hopefully people understand how that works. But we're going to get it lined up uh, to the 22nd the next time in 2029, but it's also going to be the 15th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar. And and so we, in looking at uh, the civil wars that's happening in the United States, based upon what we've been studying in Daniel chapter 11, we can then say that there is some significance in what we are talking about with this civil war and these thanksgivings. Now we know the thanksgivings begin with these civil wars, right? So that was the whole issue in um, dealing with uh, Ellen White's civil war visions and then how we connected all of these. Uh, so I'm going to go back there again. So we have, these are Ellen White's civil war visions and connected with the American Civil War, of course, and the Thanksgiving, the November 26th, 1863 Thanksgiving, this proclamation that mirrors that of George Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation. So, so we have a civil war, and we can connect it to these other civil wars, and we connect these symbols of Thanksgiving, right? So Thanksgiving, as a symbol, should be important in our history. That That's basically the argument we're making. We're saying since it was connected, a, a feast day, 
in connection with what happened in the revolution. Right. American Revolution and also what happened with the separation in 977 BC from North and South. We can see that parallels. And then we also have in the American Civil War, we have a Thanksgiving that's of note. And so we say, well, that has something to do with our history as well. Now, as far as um, the Civil War in 742 BC, do we have a counterfeit feast day? So when we study Isaiah 7 and 8, do we have something that parallels uh, this? Is there any way we can connect that civil war? Because we have it in 977. We have a counterfeit feast day. What do we have in the history of the civil war? Um that can parallel this counterfeit feast day. Because we haven't talked about this. So this is just a, a question. Do we have any that anybody can think of? We have a civil war, right? So that's pretty clear. Do we need some parallel there to tie this history? So in this this story here in Isaiah 7, do we, is there anything that we could use? So we, we've talked a bit about the the 235 months of the Mayan of the Mayan calendar, of the Metonic cycle, right? And we know that from uh, 977 to 742 is 235 years, right? And and then there's going to be 19 years from in this 65 year prophecy in verse eight. So there's going to be 19 years um, from the time that this prophecy is given until it's fulfilled with the. Um, and this is going to be pretty close to probably exactly 19 years, at least within the month, because of when this occurs. And when um, Hoshi is going to be taken captive, is going to be uh, just probably in March. This is probably around that time. So it's definitely before the start of the year. It's in his a accession year. And that's because it says um, in the days of Ahaz. So Ahaz is king. He's just become king. He's in his accession year. And um, so his... His inauguration hasn't occurred yet. So it's not in the first year of his reign. So, so is there any parallel with these 19 years, these 235 years, and then the 19 years, 235 months, that can connect us to, as a symbol, to this counterfeit feast day? And what, what would we need? What would we need to connect us? What What is it that we need to see? You're asking what we need to connect this part of the prophecy with civil war? Not with civil war, but with the Thanksgiving. Okay. All right. Because that's, that's, um, because we have a counterfeit feast day in 977. And is there any parallel symbolically? in this history in 742. Do we need anything? I would think that we would need something, but. Okay. So, okay, so, so these 19 years is what I think is the significant uh, uh, point, but um, I want you to think it through. Well, are you looking at 19 years from 1841 to 1860. Now, I wasn't thinking of that. I'm thinking more symbolically. Okay. Okay, because this has to do with the calendar. Right? So, if we think about the feast day, uh, the feast day is about a calendar, right? Right. Basically creating a new calendar. Now, 
there's things I know about this history that other people don't. One thing I know is that somewhere in this history, it's either with Ahaz or Hezekiah, the kings of Judah had always counted their reign spring to spring. But in this history, Ahaz is going to begin counting his reign fall to fall. Now, it could be Ahaz. It's possible it happened in the reign of Hezekiah, but I would think it's more likely in the reign of Ahaz because he's in rebellion. Now, why would Ahaz change the, the start of his reign to the fall rather than in the spring? Why would he start counting his reign from the fall rather than the spring? Because it, it has to happen in this history. Because we can prove that it's spring to spring before that. Um, but it's going to be fall to fall after that. So why? What, what is that indicating? So the kings of Israel, where do they count their reign from? So if anybody's tried to work up the chronology of the kings, we would find that the kings of Israel count their reign fall to fall. The kings of Judah count their reigns spring to spring. Except in this history. In the time of Ahaz, the reigns would have now been changed fall to fall. So what is Ahaz doing when he changes the count of his reign fall to fall? Is he adopting a different calendar? Wouldn't he be adopting the, the civil calendar? Yeah, and, and he's adopting the civil calendar. But it also means that he's adopting the calendar of northern Israel. Okay. Right? So it is even possible. We don't know. We don't have records of it. But since there is this worship, this counterfeit feast day on the 15th day of the eighth month in northern Israel, and since Ahaz is actually worshiping the gods of northern Israel, it is likely that he's adopting that as a feast day. doesn't explicitly state it. But if he's counting his reign fall to fall now, he's in rebellion towards God, correct? Right. He's, he's practicing the religion of northern Israel. So, so we can say that it is a symbol because of his change in his reign from spring to spring to fall to fall that that this would parallel what happens in that rebellion with Jeroboam. So Ahaz is adopting the religion of Jeroboam. I know it's a, it's a rather, you know, you have to have a bit of information that, about this and how we can prove this, that the calendar changes there. And, and one of the reasons has to do with how they, they count the reign of Hoshea and compare it to the reign of Hezekiah. So one thing we can see is that Hoshea is going to have a count of his reign that is identical in where they start the reign, because it says that uh, the seventh year of um, Hezekiah is the ninth year of Hoshea. The sixth year of Hezekiah is the seventh year of Hoshea. And, and that only occurs, that expression only occurs when, when the years start at the same time. Normally they will say it happens in the year of, uh, another king, which, and which you can show that they're staggered. So when you build the chronology of the kings of Judah and Israel, you have Israel going fall to fall, Judah going spring to spring, and then you can get these things to line up. If you have them all, that they're both counting their reign spring to spring or fall to fall. It doesn't work. Um, but in the time of Hoshi and Hezekiah, uh, it has to be that way. And so we say that it would have been in the time of Ahaz that that change would have occurred. Because Hezekiah is going to be not following. He's, he's going to be following God. He's not going to be following the religion of northern Israel. Right. So, so it must have been in the time of Ahaz. And then they continued that fall to fall all the way until the time that Zedekiah becomes king. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar puts him on the throne, the last king. It's going to be said that Zedekiah's reign lines up with 
Nebuchadnezzar's, which is spring to spring. So, so we have a parallel here in, in uh, these counterfeit feast days. It's just not explicitly stated here in Isaiah 7. Okay. Now, I don't know if we actually would need it, you know, for us to make these parallels. But in 742, we do have a parallel with the Civil War. Now, of course, uh, that there, there's so many things that connect the Civil War, but they are mirrors, right? So we know that they're mirrors. That is, the North is Confederate here, where the South is Confederate in 1863. Okay. <laughs> now, where we are trying to finish up is in understanding um, this Thanksgiving Day prediction. So the Thanksgiving Day prediction, as you can see here, we got November 22nd, 2018, and November 25th, 2018, uh, the latter being um, the 15th day of the eighth month, uh, the former being the same date in 977, but on the Gregorian calendar instead of the Julian, so November 22nd. But we have to somehow see that this is, even though this prediction just addressed that history, it has to be addressing our history. Right? So, so how do we connect this with with our history. How would we complete this study of the Thanksgivings and the Civil War? Because is the Civil War still going on today? Yes. And now the first Thanksgiving there, November 23rd, 2017, after Trump is elected. Um, How is Trump's election connected with the Civil War, with him being a president? So he's going to declare a Thanksgiving. He's going to be this is going to be the first Thanksgiving he does as president. So how are we going to relate this then to what's happening today? Repeat that question, please. OK, so what happened in November 23rd, 2017, with Trump observing Thanksgiving? as a president, and we know it's connected with the Civil War, specifically, what, what is this Civil War that we're in? What does his, his election as president have to do with the Civil War? And why is this Civil War still going on? And how would this connect to these Thanksgivings? Um, you know, one is we got one coming up, 2024, we have a Thanksgiving. Uh, so that's going to be uh, theoretically, Biden's last Thanksgiving. But it's going to happen after there's a new president, whether that's Trump or whether that's some other Republican or another Democrat. We don't know. Um, but we've done all this study on these civil wars. Now we have to try to pull it together to say, what is this telling us about what is coming in regard to the civil war that we're in? So first we have the North and the South. The North is the globalist, the South, or pardon me, the South is the globalist, the North is the Republicans, right? Thank you. Yeah. So we have the Civil War, and we know that uh, the King of the North, Trump, what, what was he doing? Why were we concerned about Trump being Xerxes? What, what was it that he was going to do? as Xerxes. That he was just going to allow someone to <clears throat> bring forth a Sunday law. Okay. Well, he was going to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Which he's done. Right. So, so, so Trump did that, right? That, that's, that's the main reason why he needed to become president because he was opposed to the globalists, Right. And so, but somehow in there, when we were first initially studying this, we said, well, he's going to come against the globalists, and now he's going to set up a Sunday law, which, which didn't really make sense once we understood 
what Trump was. So initially, when Jeff started presenting about Trump, I'm not really familiar with politics, didn't know anything about Trump other than, you know, he was on some TV show and he was a billionaire, right? Um, so I didn't really know who Trump was. And so I just kind of bought it. Okay, Trump's going to come in and he's going to, you know, bring in a Sunday law. But as we started studying Trump, we started to recognize, well, Trump isn't a globalist. He's he stirred up all against the realm of Grisha, and he's going to lose to the globalists, you know, if he's Xerxes. And so it definitely didn't make sense that he would become the head of the globalists if he's opposed to the globalists. Right. There was some reasoning that we had to try to, to do that. Um, so if he's now uh, the king of the north, how would we parallel him to what's happening, you know, back in 977, for instance? What is he representing? Is he, re is he representing Judah or Israel? And, and how do we relate that? How do we parallel this when we have things kind of inverted? So what what are, what were we doing wrong and how do we have to understand Trump? Because we're going to say he's he parallels the Republicans in the American Civil War, obviously, right? He's going to be – he's not going to be um, – you know – We'll just put it this way. The bad guy, right? If you look at the North and the South, I mean, Ellen White's quite clear that the North were, um, were correct in opposing slavery. Right? So that, that war and that final, you know, emancipation proclamation and all that was, was necessary. So, so Trump's going to be on that side. He's not going to be a racist, right? That's the globalists. That's the Democrats here, the racists, right? So, so how do we relate this back to 977, the Civil War, in in 742? Because because we have some problems we have to resolve, partly because of the mirror. I mean, it's not really clear who the good guy is in 742 BC. I mean, Ahaz is in rebellion to God. Right. Correct. Okay. And but also, you know, the north is confederate with Syria. So so how do we relate that to what's happening with the Republicans and Democrats? Because it's not really clear cut, you know, that Trump is good and the Democrats bad, anything like that. But just from a, a certain perspective, it is. Right. As far as the Sunday law is concerned at this point. Trump himself as a person is not likely to bring in the Sunday law. This would go against what he is, is doing. But it also seems unlikely that the Democrats would bring in the Sunday law. So, so we believe Republicans are going to bring in the Sunday law. So, so we don't think necessarily that the Sunday law is coming in our history immediately under Trump. So we have to try to figure out, well, how do we deal with this civil war? What is the civil war about? Okay, so what's the civil war about in 977 BC? Why is there a civil war? Let's try to get this down into very simple sort of terms, get rid of some of the details and just... Isn't it because of taxation? Okay, so there's taxation going on, right? Now... Um, so it's going to be, uh, that we had a united kingdom, right? And that united kingdom, uh, with this change that, that's going to happen with the kingship, with Solomon dying, uh, they're going to impose, um, the Stamp Act and the tea tax and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's 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 the United Kingdom that does that. Can we agree with that? All right. Okay, so we got this taxation. So well, that relates us to the Revolutionary War 
um, that creates the Declaration of Independence in the United States. Okay. So we can see the parallel there. Okay. Now we have the Civil War in 742 BC. What is this Civil War about? Just in the simplest terms. So the, the, we already have these two nations, Northern Israel and, and Southern Israel. So Ephraim and Judah. Um, well, what is this civil war about? Isn't it about worship? Okay. Well, I don't know if it's about worship because both the North and the South are worshiping false gods. So the, on the simplest terms, it is that the kingdom of the, of the North wants to put a king on the throne in the South that they can control. It's also about a confederacy. And when we have to keep that in mind that Aram, or Syria is confederate with northern Israel. And so we have to think about those details. So there has to be a confederacy that in our history that relates to that confederacy back in 742 BC. So what we're doing is we're taking all these different histories, 977, 742, 1776, whatever you want to call it, 1863, and we're taking all of these conflicts between the king of the north and the king of the south, and we're we're placing them over top of our history. Does that make sense to people? All right. And if we're doing that, we have to look at what the basic elements are, what it is that we want to see from each of those histories that applies to our history. So... With the 977, you have this. You, one is you have a prophecy of Josiah. You have a a civil war that's the result of taxation, and you have a counterfeit feast day. So those three elements all have some part to play in our history as symbols, right? In the civil war in 742, they want to take the the rightful king off the throne and place this other king, right, that they can tr control. They want a puppet government over the kingdom of Judah. Right. Now, um, one, of the th one of the things that um, um, that becomes a problem when we compare these histories as we know that, of course, they're mirrored, right? So you're going to have the North is Confederate. And when we look at that in 1863, the South is Confederate. Um, and so there's aspects of those wars that are important. The other thing you'll see in 742, again, there's a prophecy, right? So you now have the prophecy of this child that's going to be born, Manasseh. So in 977, you have a prophecy of Josiah. And that's going to be uh, fulfilled, you know, 350 years later. And it's going to be used by Ezekiel to predict the siege of Jerusalem on the 10th day of the 10th month. And then in 742 BC, you have the prophecy of this child that's going to be born. It's the 65 year prophecy that the land's going to be forsaken of both her kings. Uh, before the child is converted, right? When he knows to refuse, uh, choose the good and refuse the evil, right? So that's going to be Manasseh. That's going to be 677, uh, that he's is converted, and then that ends the 65-year prophecy. But it's going to be, um, so that prophecy, it's going to be used to begin the 22520s. So it's going to bring us to, uh, you know, 1798 American history and and uh, 1844 right with the 22520s and then the prophetic mirror created from that civil war is going to give us 1863. So so the elements there though the main thing is you have a prophecy so that's one thing but you have them wanting to take away the king and this is going to be the king of the south and replace him with the king of the north. So what the king of the north and the king of the south represent can be different things in different histories. Okay. 
Now, is there any other civil wars here that we need to, to pay attention to? Is, is this all there is? We have the civil war in 742. It's going to end in 739 with Assyria conquering, conquering northern Israel and, and Judah as well as Syria. So when we get to the American Revolutionary War, um, there's lots of things that happened before, right? So America first becomes a colony. Now, how do we understand the parallel between America and Israel? They're both the promised land. Okay, they're both the promised land, right? And so Israel leaves Egypt, right, which represents the world, and it's going to go to this promised land. It's going to conquer the land of Canaan, right? And with the United States, this is tied to what prophecies? It's tied to a few, but... I mean, the main one that we would look at would be Revelation 12, right? The earth helping the woman. Right. Okay. So, so there is, and, and, um, remember that the United States is going to represent the promised land, but it's going to represent, uh, Protestantism, right? A Protestantism is a parallel to apostate to, um, um, to northern Israel. It's apostate Protestantism. It's not apostate at the time, but it's going to become apostate. Um, so it's going to be represented what we'd call the false prophet, right? So northern Israel symbolizes the false prophet. So we have the 25, 20 years of northern Israel, and that's going to be fulfilled with the rise of the United States as this promised land. Now, it's not going to be, so for 1260 years, there's this persecution. But near the end of these 1260 years, God is going to provide a place where Protestants who are persecuted can flee, right? So you're going to have, you know, people fleeing from France, uh, Huguenot, which I'm descended from Huguenot a little bit. It's the only French I have. Um, and uh, uh, so you're going to have these people fleeing to America, okay? These are the Protestants, and, and we get Protestant America. America is a Protestant nation, right, when it's formed. It's it's opposed to Rome, correct? Correct. Um, so when people try to say, well, the United States isn't a Christian nation, um, it's pretty hard to argue because it is definitely a Protestant nation. The United States see Catholicism as a threat. And why do they see Catholicism as a, a threat to their liberty? Does the Catholic Church care about the rights of the individual? No. No, right? So so one of the things we haven't really considered in here is this, um, the role of the papacy, of Catholicism in all of this. Because we know we have the dragon the, and the false prophet, right? So the dragon, we can say, well, that's globalism. It's the UN. And then we have the false prophet. That's the United States, Protestantism, apostate Protestantism. But it's this beast power, the papacy, that um, has to be considered in uh, how it, what part it plays in these histories, at least symbolic, right? So even if you go back to 977 BC, I mean, there isn't a confederacy in 977 BC. But you do see a false system of worship, the golden calf that's being introduced. Is that in any way symbolize the papacy? It can. Okay. So you have a king of Israel offering sacrifices personally upon an altar, a religious altar that's supposed to represent the gods that have delivered them from Egypt, right? He's 
He's modeling this after the golden calf in in the time of the Exodus with Moses, right? Okay. So it's a mixture of church and state, correct? It would be. A king offering as a priest. Okay. So so you have this mixture of church and state. It's it's a symbol of the papacy. So even though there isn't another power or nation, we still have that aspect of the papacy there. Now, in 742 BC, um, you're going to have uh, this confederacy of Aram or Syria with Ephraim, northern Israel. But the king of Judah, he's going to be calling upon Assyria to be his deliverer, right? All right. So, and of course, Assyria is going to conquer them, right? So it's not really going to help them at all. Um, now, so when we deal with, uh, what happens with the rise of the United States, we see a rejection of the papacy, right? We don't see the papacy being accepted. And so the United States is being raised upon these principles, which are Protestant, separation of church and state, uh, the value of the individual, you know, to pursue his own interests, uh, that he doesn't need to, um, that, that the religion, the, the state can't have a religion. There can't be a religious test for the state. Right? They don't want the church controlling the politics. Now, in um, the American Civil War, what is it that we have here that would uh, parallel the papacy. Repeat the question. In in the American Civil War, what is it that parallels the papacy as a symbol? Not not literally that the papacy is there. Well, it was controlling both the South and the North, wasn't it? Okay. Well, I mean, it is true. Pope Pope, Pope Pius the the Ninth. Um, you know, he's going to be the the Pope at that time, right? So, I mean, he, he's going to want to, he's going to support emancipation. Now, why is he doing that? Does the Catholic Church really care about uh, slavery? No. No. So, so why does the Catholic Church take that stamp, stance during the American Civil War? I mean, that's it's kind of a, a big question. They were being kind of disingenuous because they were more supportive of what was going on in the South than at any time of what was going on in the North because they are not supportive of the capitalist system. Okay, so so they actually like slavery, but the Catholic Church is long thinking in its approach, right? Correct. But they didn't, but they didn't like Abraham Lincoln either, did they? Yeah, well, I, I don't know whether he liked Abraham Lincoln or not. I mean, no, he, brother William is right. Yeah, I mean, he, he supported emancipation. I mean, I'm not sure what his personal feelings were, but what were his actions? Well, he killed Abraham Lincoln, didn't he? Through proxy. Okay, well. Okay, is that the papacy doing it? Agents of the papacy, yes. Okay, yeah. So here we're getting into the area where there's a lot of speculation. You, you can't prove a direct connection. And you, can't, you can't explain why this happened. So, you know, we have lots of rumors and stories that go around. So... Is that really what happened? We don't know, like, as far as what the motives, right? Even if the person's motives were himself, belief in what the Catholic Church wanted. Um, we're kind of getting out of the realm of where we can actually um, look at it as symbols. So instead of dealing with literally what happened, because I don't think that we can agree on that, um, 
we would have to say that slavery is is really what the Catholic Church wants, right? The Catholic Church is not interested in freedom and liberty, the rights of the individual. It will give lip service to it when it it promotes its its ends, right? All right. Okay. So, so as far as a symbol of the papacy, we would just have to say that slavery itself symbolizes the papacy. Just, just as a symbol, rather than getting into the nitty gritty details of what happened. I mean, because we know officially Pope Pius IX supported emancipation. He wasn't officially uh, trying to have slavery continue. But you have a lot of different interests within the Catholic Church, right? People who are Catholics who want to see slavery going on in the United States for personal reasons, not necessarily religious reasons tied to the long-term goals of the papacy. But the papacy as a symbol definitely wants to see, uh, doesn't like capitalism. The papacy has always been socialist even before such a thing existed, right? Because the idea is that uh, people's lives should be controlled by the church and the church and the state should be controlled by the church, right? That's the, the principle of the papacy, right? So it wants all of the world to worship it. Okay, so so we can say that at least that in that history, the globalists are connected to the papacy, right? The Democrats are connected to the papacy. The North is not. Correct. Correct? Agreed. Okay, um, okay. so... So we have to keep that in mind. So now when we get into our history and we start, we start to take these histories and lay them over top of things. Um, it becomes a bit, bit difficult because we have to decide, you know, the North and the South. So if we're going to say the North and the South in our history, the North is going to be the Democrats or, or the, pardon me, the Republicans and the South is going to be the Democrats, correct? Correct. But but that well, what the North and South represent are different in different histories. Though they're, they're sometimes the same, right? So it's not it's not just really simple saying that the North is always representing the Republicans and the South is always representing the Democrats, right? In our history. Is it that simple that we could do that? Or or can we? Can we say can we say in 977, that um, northern Israel represents the Republicans in our history. No, I wouldn't say that northern Israel represents the Republicans. Right. So, so then we can say that the North doesn't always represent the Republicans. So here it's going to be, um, now there are some elements of the North because they're going to have uh, the false feast day. Right. So so they're going to have that. They're going to have the false system of worship. And, and we know that the north represents um, the United States. Apostate Protestantism. Right. Or the false prophet. In the end. OK. But it's not just clear cut. You can't just say, well. Everything about the north, northern Israel represents Everything about it represents the United States in our time, or represents the Republicans. Would, would it be wrong? Would it be wrong to say that in um, verse fourteen of Daniel eleven, that if you say that the part, the prostate Protestants are the North, would it be that they would also be the robbers of our people too? Okay, so 
But here, here's the problem, right? So we, we have these different histories. We have battles between the North and the South. And so you can't just say the North always represents something and the South always represents something. Now, of course, the robbers of thy people, they are going to conquer who? Who are Who is Rome going to conquer? The um, God's people. One would be God's people. Well, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 14, who are they going to conquer? They're going to conquer Greece. Okay. So do they conquer the north or the south? They conquer all of Greece, don't they? Yeah, they, they conquer all of it, right? Okay. Uh, okay. So, Dwight? Okay, I'm... I'm going to ask because I've I've had a point that I've had to consider for quite a while. Yes. Is this robbers of thy people in Daniel eleven fourteen a correct translation? Well no, which the breakers of thy people. Well, why why would the translators have this as the children of the robbers of thy people that i have no idea so Here's my question for well, my well, my version don't say children it says just the robbers of my people okay now my my question is simple we have been, we have been told by sister white mm -hmm. that the time of the papacy has passed and that they will be surprised by how the Protestant churches enforce Sunday. So is it possible that this is not just referencing to the papacy, but is referencing to apostate Protestantism as well? Okay, well, well, we know it's that Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, right? So the whole idea is this is going to be Rome. Now, it is true that there is a word here, ben, which is normally translated as son, right? Um, which includes lots of different things, grandson, subject, nation, quality, condition, um, bow, branch, breed, bullock, right? There's lots of different ways in which it's translated. Right. Um, so when we look at uh, Young's literal translation here the sons of the destroyers of thy people do lift themselves up to establish the vision right and they stumbled right that's what he has I have another uh, literal translation that says um, the sons of the violent ones of your people shall rise up to establish the vision. So you can put sons in there. I don't know if you put children, but um, but it's also the ones that have built uh, this kingdom. So there's something that's being built to that is going to uh, rise up to establish the vision, right? Right. And this is going to be Rome. So we know that it's going to be Rome. And so I don't think it's descendants of Rome that's being talked about. It's Rome itself is the sons of the breakers of thy people or the ones who have built this, this kingdom. So um, now when it says exalt themselves, Nasa, to lift up, right? Again, um, this has a lot of different meanings meanings like a lot of Hebrew words do. Um, so, you know, I think arise is probably the best translation rather than exalt. And then they're going to establish the vision, right? So remember, this establishes that word stand, right? So what you see is you see this nation standing up. It's arising, and this would have to be Rome, not the sons of Rome were the descendants of, you know, the Roman Empire, but Rome itself that's being raised up at this time. So 
So you could put sons in there, but you, you want to be careful in how you, it's not the descendants of the Romans that are doing this. No, I, I agree it's not that. I, know, I agree it's okay. not the literal descendants. Yeah. But in this, in this situation, what we're dealing with is the, these robbers of thy people, whether we're, whether we're going to agree on this being the spiritual successors or something else, they are exalting themselves to establish the vision or establish the calzone. Yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. And the idea here is actually that these are the sons of a tyrant. It would probably be a better translation of the Hebrew. Okay. Version. On three zero. Where, so these, so these are a tyrant. Yeah. Where can, where can, if, if that's the case, then the part that would mean prostate Protestant says will establish the vision, which is the, the, um, image to the beast, right? No, that's not what this is talking about. We're looking at it historically what's happening here. Right. So historically, right. this is the rise of Rome. It, that's right. I understand it's wrong. It has nothing to do with Protestants. This is wrong. But does it, does not the prostate Protestants are the ones who, who, um, bring in the image to the beast? Yeah, but that's not what's being talked about here. It's not talking about the image of the beast. Okay. This, this is when Rome comes in it, ahead of time, right? So it exalts itself to establish the vision, and then it's going to go and show about how Rome comes and and conquers Greece. Well, that leads to another question. Then, I, what is okay if the United States symbolically is Rome, right? It's the North, right? Where it established the vision by the image of the beast, right? Okay. Um, dep- okay. Yeah. So the United States is symbol- symbolized by Rome in certain aspects, but not in every aspect. Right. Okay. I mean, the two, the two republics that A.T. Jones wrote. If you read that book, it's a pretty big, thick book. But what what he's doing is he's. I haven't parallel- read it. I, I I've read parts a little bit of it, but I ain't yeah. read all of it. Yeah. So anyway, what he's doing is he's paralleling, he's showing the fall of Rome, how Rome came into power and how it fell, its history. And then he goes into and shows how that illustrates what's going to happen with the United States, because they're both republics and they both fall, right? So you can say, you know, that Rome typifies the United States. But here in this history, uh, Rome is typifying the papacy, not the United States. That's how we've always applied it. Okay. Right. So, and that's because the papacy is going to come in with Reagan, and and that's how it exalts itself to establish the vision. Right. Because it's going to come and 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 join with the United States, and and there it comes early. But later on, it's going to rise again at the Sunday law. So in a sense, it comes early into that history, and then later on, it comes and takes its place when it's going to be set upon the throne of the earth, right at the Sunday law. Okay. So, you know, so we can't really say that that Rome here is the United States. Um, now, we have but the it, king of the it north. Is, but it is, but it is, but it is, um, it, it represents the north, right? King of the north. Well, yeah, because it, the United States, the American army joins with the papacy, right? Okay. Right. Right. It's going to become the army of the papacy. Okay. And, and it's also as the economic power. But here, we have to remember we're looking first at what happened historically. Right. And then we, we say, well, what does that say about Rome? So 
when we talk about Rome exalting itself, we're not talking about the United States exalting itself to establish the vision. We're talking about the papacy in our time. Okay. So, so the king of the north, you know, the king of the north is the papacy, right? So when you go to Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 41. Well, I know that you, uh, yeah, I read it too. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. Right. When he enters into the glorious land, you know, that's the United States. The he is the king of the north, right? right. King of the right. north is the papacy, right? We're not going to say the king of the north is the United States. The king of the north is going to shall, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, that is the king of the north, at 1798. That's the papacy. We don't say it's the United States. Right. And then the king of the north shall come against them like a whirlwind. Well, that's going to be the papacy. But it's going to use chariots and horsemen and many ships. That's economic and military power. That power comes from the United States. So in some ways, the United States joins with the papacy and becomes the king of the north. And in certain senses, really, the king of the north is the papacy. The king of the south is atheism. So in verse, in verse 12 of 11, where it says, and he and when he has taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up. And that that he right there is the king of the south, right? Yeah, because what we have here, this is this is the battle of Raphia. Okay. Right. So we parallel that with uh, the Democrats conquering the Republicans. So that's internal within the United States. Okay. Right? So so this is where we have these problems. We have, this is a civil war within the United States. In this case, the king of the north is the Republicans and the king of the south is the Democrats when we make an application to our history. Right. All right. So when it talks about that the robbers of thy people or the sons of tyrants um, and that against thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. You know, if we're looking at this historically, we know that's Rome. So in our history, that has to be the papacy. Right. But we we're making different applications of, it, and that's, that's going to be confusing. So we have a lot to sort out is all I'm trying to say here. That is, we can't look at this simplistically. So, You know, in some ways, you know, we can also say we've made a mess of everything because we have all of these symbols and and we have to figure out how we can have these symbols be consistent and represent what it is that we're trying to illustrate. And well, I don't believe we, yeah, I don't believe we I don't believe we can I don't believe we should be getting the, the robbers of our people mixed up. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're not. We're not. We know it's wrong. OK. Right? That's what we're saying all this time. It's wrong. Okay. So we're not getting it mixed up at all. No. So, so yeah, we can't make it anything else other than wrong. All right. Okay. So, but now we're trying to make an application. So, so we've gone through Daniel chapter 11, dealing with the North and the South, right? All the way dealing with Greece. We introduced where Rome comes into play. And then we said, what we have to do is we have to look at these civil wars. So we spent time looking at these civil wars. And so in these civil wars, at the end of all these civil wars between the North and the South, we have Rome come in, right? That's right. Okay, now Rome... In this context of the North and the South is not the king of the North or the king of the South, because this, this is a civil war in the United States. Right. So even though we call Rome the king of the North because it conquers that territory. Right. And it's going to be North 
of, you know, Israel. So, so we, we end up calling it the king of the north and it becomes sim- the king of the north symbolizes it in Daniel chapter 11, verse, you know, 40 to 45. We're going to have the king of the north being the papacy and we're going to have the king of the north even earlier being the papacy. So 36, right, 31 to 36, all that history there. The king of the north, the papacy conquers the north. It becomes the king of the north. Okay. But we can't get that confused with how we're making this civil war, which is just within the United States, right? So we're making an application of it within the United States. So that is the, that is we're paralleling Greece with the United States, just as we paralleled Medo Persia with the United States. So in that context, the robbers of thy people that exalt themselves to establish the vision, that is the papacy in our history. Is that clear to people? It is to me. I just, I just want to make okay. sure. Yeah. So, so the papacy is not the king of the north and the king of the south in the civil war in the United States. It's some other power. It's some other, uh, it's either, you know, the enemy or it's part of the confederacy, right? But it exists all behind the scenes in these histories. In 977, it's going to be this um, false worship, right? This mixture of church and state are being typified, right? You have a king offering upon an altar, which he's not supposed to do, right? And it's on a counterfeit feast day. She'll think to change times and laws, right? That's, That's the spirit of the papacy. In the Civil War in 742 to 739, um, we have Judah, the king of Judah, who's looking to Assyria as his deliverer, right? Now you have northern Israel that's confederate with Syria, right? And then Judah is confederate, I guess, with Assyria. Um you know, so the question is, well, this is a civil war in the United States. So obviously the papacy itself is not the king of the north or the king of the south. But you do have a changing of a religious law. This time it's going to be the king of Judah, not the king of Israel, who's going to institute a change in the calendar. It's going to be Ahaz. He's going to adopt the calendar of northern Israel. Not sure why, other than that he's involved in this false worship. And and that's what he's going to choose to do. In the American Revolution, you have a United Kingdom, just as you did in 977 BC, the United Kingdom of Israel. You have heavy taxation. That's the reason they separate. And, and you're going to have the United States separate from... Uh, this United Kingdom from from England, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's not a civil war within the United States. So it's 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 a revolutionary war. And so we're saying, well, we, we can call it a civil war in a sense, you know, just like the one in 977 BC to some degree. The United States is part of this United Kingdom, and it's going to rebel. These 13 states are going to 13 colonies are going to become independent states, and they're going to join together in the United States of America. Okay, so, you know, where is the papacy in this? You know, how how do we look at it? We can't just simply look at, well, who's the North and who's the South in the American Revolutionary War? So, again, it's not as clear cut. So we have to be able to to understand these histories and where the symbols are in each of these histories. And they're not always the same. Now, the American Civil War, that's a little clearer, right? Because we can tie that up with 742 BC. But we can see that we can't just simply make the North the North and the South the South, because the South is Confederate in 1863, where the North is Confederate 
in 742. And there are certain aspects of, of what Ahaz is doing uh, that align some ways with the South, but certain aspects that align with the North. So, you know, how do we understand that? And then when we apply it to our history, we now have this battle between Republicans and Democrats. In some ways, it's a holdover from the American Civil War, right? And the Democrats have maneuvered themselves to look like they're on the side of, of you know, religious tolerance and, and all these types of things, but they're just speaking out of both sides of their mouth, right? Because we can see that what they're doing is stirring up hatred. They're creating confusion and destruction. And um, so, so the Democrats definitely aren't in the right. And then, of course, you have uh, the Republicans and you have somebody like Trump, who's, you know, a polarizing feature. And, and basically, he's, he's sort of a product, but also a catalyst of this civil war, right? Because this civil war has been going on for a while in the United States. And, and Trump isn't really um, a part of the Republican Party. I mean, it really, he's a Democrat who became a Republican so he could get elected. But he is a constitutionalist. So he has some of the values of the Republican Party, at least what they should be. Um, so now we have to sort through all of this. It's going to take a little bit of work because, as you can see, it's it's not very, very simple. Now, some people argue against what we do because they say our stuff is too complex. You know, that the gospel is supposed to be simple and us, um, you know, doing what we do with all these numbers and dates and all this history that's just rather complicated um, is is creating uh, way more complexity than there needs to be. But I do think we can we can if we understand the symbols properly, we should be able to apply them correctly. Right. Just seems complicated because of all the work that we have to do to understand things. But once we understand it, we should be able to present it clearly to people that they can see what we're talking about. So what is this civil war? What what is the why is there a civil war? Prophetically, what is this civil war about? Why are there civil wars? Maybe that's the question we can answer tomorrow. Control. Okay, yeah, so control, but I mean prophetically. So so we have to look at that. What all of these civil wars meant both in the, in the Bible and also in American history, what they mean as symbols, why, why they exist in the first place, and why it's always the North and the South. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. We have a lot to look at this week, and we just ask that you can help us in our personal study uh, to sort through what it is we're trying to understand from your word. We ask for your angels' care and protection, and that uh, this week in these studies can be a blessing. Help us throughout this day uh, to represent you, and we pray for one another. You know the needs uh, that many of us have. Um, and uh, we just lift each other up in prayer. Help us to encourage one another. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.